On a mid-December day in 2015, Bob Leverett, who is an expert on eastern old-growth forests, and I have come to Monroe State Forest in western Massachusetts to remeasure the Thoreau Pine. We hike in along this tributary of the Deerfield River. The boulder fields on the steep mountainsides here are a rich, wet habitat that grows some grand old trees. Even though the foliage is down now for the coming winter, it's easy to see that this is a lush growing environment. Boulders and fallen trees are draped in green mosses due to the constant draining of water down the mountain. Old yellow birches are like raptors grasping the boulders. Old and young yellow birches thrive here, as do maples, ashes, hemlocks, beeches, and others, including the eastern white pine. Joining us today is Richard Higgins of Concord, Mass. Rich is a Thoreau scholar and is currently writing a book about Henry David. He's come to see the big tree that was named after the subject of his studies. This is a fine example of a large old red maple. We come to another one that has fallen. So, Bob, do you think this <coughs> tree has seen better days? Indeed, I recall back in the probably around 1993, 94, coming through here, and we often came up to the base of this tree. It was one of the prettier, more stately red maples. And then I came in one one uh, weekend, and it was down. And uh, here it is, whatever. 20 years later or so, and you can see the state of decay. They go fast, 30, 40 years, and one of these trees, within these maples completely decay, and they're gone, and you never even know they're there, and where they are, um, or where they were, I should say, young sprouts come up, and that can be very confusing to someone trying to understand the history of the forest. There's a lot of change going on. Well, they also become <clears throat> become a nurse log to other species, right? Yes, often often do, and and of course when they're in that stage of being a nurse log, then you see them and the trees are following a straight line, the the trunk. And sometimes people look at that later when the trunk has disappeared, and they think that was human created that pattern. Yeah, yeah. As we make our way to the great pine, Bob takes the opportunity to measure other trees we encounter as he always does. We're in Monroe State Forest, just a few miles below the Vermont border in uh, Massachusetts, going up a ridge line to what we see above is the great Henry David Thoreau Pine. This is a giant. It's one of the few in New England that or in its size class. We're going to remeasure it today, but I think Henry David would have been mightily impressed with it. It's somewhere approaching 160 feet in height, and it's about 13 and a half feet in circumference at breast height above the base. And at this point in time, we have no other tree in New England that combine over 13 feet and 160 foot height combination. So we think it is it, it fits the stature of Henry David Thoreau. And so with that, we will move up the uh, ridge and do our work. This is a great tree. Yet you don't get the full impact of its size and stature until you make the trek up the mountainside right up to it. Well, at 13.2, but I'm looking at, it floats uphill here. Yeah. I gotta bring it down a little more level. Can you pull it? Yeah, yeah, hold on. No stairs here, Bob. We're down, what, six inches? That looks good right there. Okay. 13.3. Okay. If, if you were to model it and figure out what the actual physical volume increase of wood in this tree per year is, it's probably about 
eight to ten cubic feet well, what still about per the fact year. That the, the uppermost needles, the crown is in the light, it's a lot of sunlight, so there's a lot of yeah. photosynthesis. Does that help the growth at all? Well, yeah, I mean, by, by virtue of the fact that its crown is up there and getting plenty of light, it's got a big, big crown. Yeah. This, this tree has got a crown that's roughly 60 feet yeah, wow. uh, wide, and, and that, that's a lot of crown. And there's a lot of needles up there, and that's a lot of photosynthesis. So it, it's not that it isn't doing, it isn't that it's not growing or packing on wood. It's just when it gets this large, I mean, anybody can look and see a, a tiny little tree, a three or four foot tree grow from one year to the next and talk about how, you know, fast yeah, they're right, growing right, and all that right. sort of thing. Then they look at this kind of a tree and they say, well, you know, it isn't growing at all. Well, that's not true. Not true. It is continuing to grow. Another interesting characteristic of the Thoreau pine is that it has epicormic sprouts arising from clusters of buds on the main trunk, something not often seen in white pines. So far as I know, this is the only tree we know of in all of New England that combines a circumference of 13 or more feet with a height of 160 feet or more. This is it. Well, it's wonderful to be here in Monroe State Forest next to this massive, beautiful pine. And here in the Bay State, the home state of Henry David Thoreau, after whom this gorgeous tree is named, Thoreau would have deeply admired it, and especially its ramrod straight, straight as an arrow. Uh, he, he loved that. He, he felt that was a sign of the noble nobility of trees, that they were so erect. And he said that, Nothing stands up more free from blame than a pine tree. And he also, in the Maine woods, discussed all the different uses they make out of pine trees. From turpentine, of course, lumber and tar and whatnot. The lamp black factory he mentioned. And he said, but these are not the highest use of the pine. He said, it's not the spirit of turpentine that I love, but the living spirit of the tree. Well, he said this tree was as immortal as I am, and that it would go to as high a heaven and tower above me still. And this tree certainly does tower over this valley. Mm -hmm.